This Fleet Equipment unscripted interview is presented by Hendrickson, a leading manufacturer of heavy-duty suspension systems and components to the global commercial transportation industry. Visit hendrickson-intl.com to learn more. Hi, everyone. I'm Jason Morgan, Content Director for Fleet Equipment, and welcome to Fleet Equipment Unscripted. Today, we're talking with Colin Shaw, President of MEMA Original Equipment Suppliers, and Alex Bosenberg, MEMA's Vice President of Regulatory Affairs. Gentlemen, thanks for joining me today. Thank you very much. Okay, I'm excited to talk with you guys because we're going to be talking about all the emissions rules that are happening. I think it's getting really, really super complicated, so I appreciate you guys taking the time to walk us through it. Uh, Can you give us a quick overview of where we're at here with heavy-duty engine emission rules and where we stand with the EPA? Alex, do you have any thoughts and guidance there? Certainly. Well, in brief, um, as I think most folks figured out by now, the EPA finalized the rule for heavy duty greenhouse gas phase three. Um, And um, I think your listeners will also know that they finalized the nitrous oxide rules back in December, 2022. So this Mm -hmm. is the final of the two different rules that were planned. And so we don't anticipate any changes now for a while till they go back through another iteration. Uh, There's one caveat I'll mention at the end. Uh, So um, it's finished. We've gone through the rule. We're looking forward to hearing back from our members as they uh, continue conversations with their customers. Um, But essentially, as near as we can tell, it's technologically feasible in that if someone really badly needs or wants a diesel, they'll still be able to make one. Um, Through things like averaging, banking, and trading, and other provisions, there will also be opportunities to have diesel still in the mix, but obviously, as everyone's really saying, the rules strongly encourage zero emissions vehicles or hybrid Mm -hmm. drivetrains. Particularly for heavy duty, it's either hydrogen combustion, hydrogen fuel cell, and in cases where it's practical, battery electric. Uh, And so, like I said, we're waiting to hear back from our members and but our my analysis is i can't find any significant faults with the rule if as it were like any mistakes or whatever however you want to categorize it the epa i think worked very hard to strike a balance and deliver a rule where everybody could get something they needed you know there's there's places where one type is not practical over another and it appears that 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 balance was struck but like i said we're looking forward to hearing from our members I mentioned going forward a future or something about the rule might change. The EPA did in response to a lot of public concerns about infrastructure and the pace of technology innovation for some of the advanced uh, drivetrains I mentioned that they will conduct uh, investigations and release reports on how that is all sort of coming together. We're looking at a lot of technologies that sort of all need to come together in 2027, 2030 and 20 and beyond. And so if there's any trouble with that, the EPA reserved the right to conduct another rulemaking sort of off cycle, if you will, to try to address that. But I don't think they have that office stood up yet. I'm not sure they have a solid plan for that yet, but we are reaching out to them and offering or asking to be part of that as they set up that structure so we can have that communications pathway when the time comes. Did I miss anything, Colin? No, I think uh, no, I think that's really good. Colin, you have any additional thoughts to, to toss in there? Yeah, I think you know when I when I look at how the EPA rules come about, um, it's always important that we do a good job of listening to the end customer, and the end customer being the fleet. And um, what I I think is particularly fascinating is as you talk to every fleet, every fleet has a little bit different way in which they use a truck company that hauls oil and gas uses a truck very different than a company that hauls, let's say, potato chips, and there's a lot of air. What's important is that as we go forward with these, and I'm looking at this from the perspective of a supplier, and that's the group that I represent, but you have to first look at it from the fleet point of view. If fleets are able to implement these rules and, and make sure they have all the equipment, that's I'll be honest, a lot of what I've heard, and especially over the last few days, is that it could be very difficult based on the some of the available technology and how companies use their equipment to move as quick as people want. And 
what that then says to me is, okay, as I work backward through the value chain of a truck, how does this affect the supply base? The one thing that I keep coming back to is our mission to provide a profitable ecosystem for suppliers. And the technology is there. It can be industrialized. But what is the payoff? And so as a supplier, the supplier industry has gone from about 8.5% of profitability in 2017 to about 3% today. And they have to continue to invest and make sure this technology is available. What I want to make sure happens is the ability to buy the equipment is reasonable. Fleets are able to make money on the equipment because if fleets are not profitable, the supplier base can't be profitable. So that's what I come back to when I think about this is we have to do, a, I think, a better job listening to the end customer, a dealer and a fleet, to make sure they can profitably run their business, transport freight, so that then the supplier base can be profitable. So they can innovate and make trucks cleaner and more efficient rather than trying to just go there and some of what we see today is there's a lot of stranded capital in the supply base. You have a lot of assets not being used. And so that is the one thing I would caution and say to people as we go through this is let's listen to the end customer a little more. Make sure they're taken care of because then that flows all the way back through the entire value train back to the raw materials. Right, right. Well, and, and I, what both of you are talking about here is striking that balance between that technology advancement and practical implementation, especially in getting that right in the new regulations, right? What are you hearing from the members in that regard or even how they feel? You know, I, I mean, I think back to uh, uh, heavy duty aftermarket week and all the kind of talk around there. And I, I you know, even then I had sensed some uh, wanting to go in the right direction, but still some frustration with, that, with that, the, how how to get there, right? What's the what's the feeling with your with your membership? Definitely, I think it's mixed. Um, yeah. You know, the technology is certainly available. Uh, people can build these. The bigger question is the industrialization and how to make this profitable and sustain a business. That's what that's what we hear. And that's where the trepidation comes into a lot of this because there have been, you know, peaks and valleys. You know, we've gone through this with the autonomous side. There was a really hot and heavy on autonomous trucking. You know, that is a more measured approach now. <clears throat> In the passenger car market, you know, electrification was, hey, we're just jumping right into electrification. Now it's, they're taking a more measured approach. Hey, let's look at hybrids. Let's look at plug-in hybrids. And so, again, when I look at this from the consumer and then the supply base, it's, hey, I've invested all this money for what you told me was going to happen, and, and the consumer's not buying it. So now I have to figure out how to use that capital and return the value to my business and shareholders. And so I think that that's why the supply base is a little bit hesitant uh, because they, they, they've been burned a couple times before. And you know we all have to run businesses. We all have to make sure that we run profitable companies to keep our people employed and to reinvest that back into our products and also you know, meet the needs of shareholders. So that that's where I think it becomes mixed. It's, I think, less the technology and really more the, the business fundamentals of how do we make this work. Well, I think Colin summed it up very well. It's, you know, our members make technology and we offer quite a lot of technology, but it's a question of whether it takes every, every scrap of technology to make a truck compliant. Is that truck then affordable or reliable? And then we haven't even talked about workforce upskilling that's needed for a lot of the new technology. It, um, I mentioned it before, the EPA has put a lot of expectation and a lot of things coming together in the out years. Um, Right. But we'll do our part, and in for the, you know, most cases, the technology there uh, exists anyway. Right. And so there's a lot of coordination, and I think that's where a lot of the trepidation uh, is also mm -hmm. coming. But uh, thankfully, the EPA put in that pledge to investigate and report and reserve the right to conduct future, you know, as I said, off-cycle rulemaking. It's not really the, it's just a rulemaking, but um, before doing the whole rule again. So I... Um, I guess time will tell if we need to invoke that. Well, definitely. And, you know, I mean, it's interesting because I think in, in these early days, especially on the battery electric side, that uh, especially some of the regulatory side, uh, maybe even outside of the EPA and CARB, was kind of tunnel vision into that zero emissions as opposed to kind of taking a holistic decarbonization 
view of what needs to happen with, a, as you're pointing out, a mix of these technologies to get us to zero here coming up to 2040 and 2050. So going forward, you're out there, you're working uh, with, with regulators, you're working with your membership. What's on your radar in terms of how you hope to uh, inform future uh, improvements to EPA rules as requirements become more stringent and you want to support technologies that are that are uh, applicable for trucking. Alex, how do you approach that uh, in day to day? Well, we have pretty good distribution links and, and communication links with our members. We're always looking for ways to reach more and more effectively, certainly. Um, moving forward, I mean, the rules are out. So as we if we hear there's wrinkles or hiccups, We'll engage with the regulators. Um, now the rulemaking is over. We can just pick up the phone and call EPA and ask questions before it was under mm -hmm. very strict requirements for information management. Um, and also something that I'm be working on now is the safety standards because mm. we've got FMCSA and NHTSA that are having to do companion standards for some of these advanced technologies. Um, and so those are coming out now. We're working on comments to those. And those are just as important we're focusing very heavily on making sure they're harmonized with existing uh, our European or Asian standards so that our members aren't having to make one product and build it five different ways, which is always a concern. There's good reasons for deviation, but where it's not necessary, we're going to try to minimize it. Right. Very good. Colin, any final thoughts? Yeah. So, <clears throat> Jason, one of the things that we do is so I'm, I'm here in Austin, Texas. Uh, we're finishing up uh, a two-day meeting with what we call the Heavy Duty Business Forum. It's a group of about 50 CEOs from the supplier community. And what we do is we regularly get together. We bring in speakers that have a broad range of thoughts and how they're running their business. So we have representatives from OEMs. We also have dealership owners or fleet owners. And we bring these groups together for the reason of what I talked about is listening understanding where each of the perspectives is coming from because the requirements on an OEM are very different than what we're seeing at a dealer. Let's say you're a dealer in California and you're trying to comply with CARB and you're trying to look at the EPA. How do you run your business? It is the opinions and what is being discussed are drastically different when you talk to a couple of the different groups. So one of the things that we really work on is bringing these groups together so as a supplier goes back and they hear hey, we, we can build the trucks, we have some of this technology, and then they hear the voice of the customer on the ground, let's say a dealer or a fleet, and they're like, we are struggling here. You know, we're, we want to do everything we can to support, but the order, some of the orders aren't coming in, we're concerned about the cost of the truck. Right. That really helps the supplier base, and I think others to inform their decision on how do they invest, where do they put their people? Where do they put their capital? And those are some of the things that we do quite a lot. We've you know, traditionally been a little bit more behind the scenes in this, but I think what you'll see is um, us being a little bit more front and center with the voice of the supplier based on some of these groups that really help to lead the industry. I mean, we I have 50 of the top supplier CEOs in a room, and this is a, a group that helps to push the industry along. And I think those are those are things that are very valuable going forward. And I'm just grateful that we have the ability to, to bring these partners together because everybody does listen when we get into a room like this. And, and it helps us as an industry move forward and tackle these, these questions and, and issues we have. Right. Well, I appreciate both of you taking the time to help me tackle a lot of this information. I know there's a lot going on. Appreciate you taking the time. As more of this rolls out, I'm sure we'll talk to you both again very soon. Jason, thank, uh, you. thank you for all the work you do.